Work-life balance, the way I define it, is basically an acknowledgement that personal and work lives, personal and paid lives, do not necessarily have to be seen in competing light. So they can be seen as complementary phenomena instead of competing phenomena. There are many reasons for work-life balance to be considered as an important topic, and we can see it from multiple levels. We can see it, of course, from the organizational perspective, because organizations want to have talented employees who are motivated and productive enough, and who are not, for example, facing issues such as burnout, stress, negativity, conflict, demotivation, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, we are also interested in having employees uh, whose well-being is of concern to us, who are healthy, not only physically, but also emotionally. So that, is, that could be possible only when organization and other appropriate institutions are paying attention to work-life balance. I think that instead of uh, research, which is, in my view, important in the context of work-life balance, is perhaps we need to uh, take more reflective and critical view of what exactly is meant by work and what exactly is meant by life. So uh, we also need to more critically reflect on the fact that uh, at what stage work and life became in conflict. Hmm? So how work is being defined, how life is being defined, and where exactly do they coincide, and where, do they, where, do, where exactly do they come into conflict. The very view that work is something which was first uh, uh, in the way modern management and organization was defined, it was separated from uh, life, and then efforts were made to bring somehow uh, life and work into some kind of balance is not only interesting but also challenging proposition for academic scholars and practitioners. Put it this way, that uh, with the advent of modern technology, with the advent of information technology and communication, so much is on the uh, desk currently at the organizational disposal to provide to their employees, for example, in the shape of the uh, laptop, in the shape of the internet, in the shape of email and iPad and iPhone and so on and so forth. So how exactly, is, how is it exactly are these gadgets facilitating employees? Perhaps they might be facilitating employees, but to what, to what extent are they impinging upon the personal and family space of employees? So that is some, these are some of the issues which would need to be addressed, not only by academic scholars, but also by practitioners. I think the key debates which I have already identified, they would vary from one country to uh, other and one region to other. For example, in the Indian context, in the last two or three decades, particularly in the last uh, two decades, we have seen an increasing rate of suicide in the uh, IT capital or Silicon Valley capital of India, which is Bangalore. So for example, in 2011, as far as I, uh, I remember, there were at least 47 suicide rates, uh, suicide, incidents of suicide, uh, when people who were working in the IT industry, they committed suicide because they were laid off or because they thought that they were unable to meet the requirements of work. Uh, the ne very next year, in 2012, the number doubled or even more than that. So there is something which is really worrying, and not only in India, but also in the UK, US, Australia, where uh, people, because of their various reasons, they are becoming incre increasingly concerned about how to manage work and life. And this concern, let me reassert, is not only a concern of individual employees. That concern is equally shared by organizations and societies. I think on a global scale, we would need to more critically reflect on, and as I have already very briefly touched upon, that how we are defining organization and how we are defining management. For example, I would like to refer to more uh, spiritual uh, and faith-based view of work and life. For example, where work is not only there for the service of organizations, work is not only there for the service of some uh, chief executive officer or entrepreneur, but work is also meant as a service to the community and to the family and to one's own personal lifestyle.
I think the uh, new research directions in the area of work-life balance, which I find exciting, are those which are coming from critical race scholars, those which are coming from feminist scholars, uh, which are uh, highlighting the uh, importance of considering gender identity and race identity uh, into the consideration or into the definition and approach and implementation of work-life balance. So those are some of the areas which I personally consider exciting. And also I think that there is also an important to perhaps depart from the mainstream notions of work-life balance and look at how work-life balance was managed. For example, in the pre-colonial India, when uh, we didn't have this modern industrialized concept of organization, and when, for example, I'm talking about somewhere around 1680, when India's GDP was 25% to the tune of 25% of the world total GDP, and the Europe's entire GDP was less than 17%. So something was there, which was, which was not only helping work, but also the traditional emphasis on family, which was a characteristic of the Indian subcontinent. participation, speak to your employees, uh, have their views on how uh, exactly they would like to manage their work and life, and, and, and also take into account that employees come in all various uh, dimensions. They have various dimensions of identity, they have various dimensions of diversity, and they have various circumstances and concerns. So all of those issues need to be taken into account, but organizations cannot take those issues into account unless organizations start some conversation. So dialogue and, dialogue and participation is the answer. Well, the idea of this book, Managing Diversity and Inclusion, a critical perspective, which is currently being published by Sage uh, Publications, came to uh, my mind four years ago when Mustafa Belgen, my co-editor, and I, we met uh, at an annual meeting of the Academy of Management, and we also met with a number of our colleagues, academics in the US, UK, Australia, and other universities who uh, a thought, and all of us agreed that there was a need for a critical text, an international text in the area of diversity management. And uh, particularly based on my own experience, uh, previously I used to teach uh, at the University of Kent, uh, and currently I'm at a different university, University of Huddersfield. Based on my own experience, I thought that I definitely needed for, uh, to teach courses uh, at the postgrad level and also at the undergrad level, I needed to have a text which can not only satisfy the theoretical requirements, but also can provide some important organizational and case study insights. So therefore, the structure of the book uh, in consultation with other colleagues was identified to have a fair combination or a fair collection of theoretical insights, critical insights, but also case examples from international, uh, from international context. And in particular, our focus was uh, not only on Europe and Australia, but also on BRICS, Brazil, Russia, uh, India, uh, South Africa, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so therefore, uh, uh, I think that this book not only hopefully is promising, but also very exciting for instructors, practitioners, and researchers in the area of diversity management. Mm -hmm.